not quite as many as downtown, but uh, a good mix of people. Um, you know, a lot of visitors, a lot of students, a, a lot of people who own property or work in the district. Uh, main purpose is really entertainment and, and to be there for events and, and to, to have a good time. So I'm going to run through a series of slides that really are in tandem. There's one slide that is customers, employees, and owners, or residents, and the next one is mostly uh, due to the university. Same question, different set of respondents. Um, and so this one, if you, what, what this says and what the next one says about the students is pretty much everybody drives. Um, and, and when they drive, uh, they park a lot in the district on the municipal owned facilities, either the city streets or the city lots. The one exception here is, is the UNI employees who have permits and they tend to park in the UNI lot, UNI lots. How important is parking as it relates to your decision to visit the district? Again, both sets of, pretty much split, both sets of uh, UNI related people and customers, employees, and owners, right down the middle that about 50% say it's an important consideration that when I'm going to the hill, it, I think about parking. This is always a fun question in, in any city, in any location, is how far are you willing to walk? And uh, willing <laughs> and what's acceptable and what you want all can kind of be different things. We like to park right out front for free and walk a few steps into our location. That's what we do at home, but by and large, and that's what we'd like to do when we go places. Uh, but people, I think, gave fairly reasonable responses here. Uh, a majority of people said they would walk uh, you know, one, uh, two to three blocks, which I think is a reasonable distance to walk in, in a city like Cedar Falls. And, and again, the, the students, I was actually a little surprised by the student response because they walk all over all day. And so for them to say, oh, I don't want to walk any more than two blocks kind of surprised me because they easily walk uh, multiple, multiple times more than that every day. So, do you believe that parking should be more strictly enforced in the area? And I, I did find this interesting as well. Um, the people who get tickets, the students and the residents, would like less enforcement. The people who want more access to the spaces um, and probably don't get as many tickets uh, would like more enforcement. And so that makes sense, that the user type uh, wanting it. I did see tickets when I was up there, uh, both days that I was there. Uh, there is some level of enforcement there. How long do they stay? This, is, this was interesting only in its, its comparison to downtown. People spend less time on the hill than they do downtown. Uh, but still, right in that, that one to two hour range is your sweet spot. And most of your time parking is in there, one to two hour range. Um, how would you characterize your ability to find a spot? So this really is opinion here, is how easy is it to find a spot? And, and a lot of people did say, I have some difficulty. The, the yellow and then the, the light blue at the bottom are somewhat difficult and difficult and inconvenient. And as you can see, uh, a lot of people marked those as uh, higher on their list. So the perception that it's hard to park there on a weekday is, is out there. Uh, lunchtime, even worse. A lot of light blue. Very difficult to find a spot when I'm looking at lunchtime. Uh, same with the UNI staff. Um, evening or weekend, uh, same thing. People say they have a hard time finding a parking space. Again, I say this is their perception of what's going on out there. Evening and weekend. And back to this question, does the availability of parking influence your decision to visit the district? And virtually everyone says yes. It has an impact. The availability, if I, do I know when I show up that I'm going to have a space? Uh, and, and that does impact their decision. Okay, so we dabbled into the, and again this isn't a recommendation by any stretch, but we dabbled into the thought process of, of paid parking and, and uh, would you be willing to pay if you could park a little closer? And this, this is actually very consistent with what we see across the country, is employees and owners say no, but the customers, the people actually going to the venues, 
they're willing to pay a little if it means they can park close and know that the thing, it's not about parking close, it's not about paying, it's about knowing that I have a spot. That when I get there, there'll be something for me and I won't have to drive around for 20 minutes that I can park, even if I've got to pay, and I can go right in. And you can see uh, students, they don't want to pay at all. They're more willing to park. So you have a different behavior pattern in demographics in that the students are more willing to walk for free. If you push them out a little, they're willing to walk those three blocks for free. Uh, whereas your customers, they'd like to be a little closer and they're willing to pay for that privilege. And then I, I did find this interesting as well. Uh, UNI students freely admit they use the city's facilities, the on-street uh, and the off-street city lots. The off-campus UNI students, a good chunk of them do park on campus. So they, they know they can get those B permits and, and find a spot, but a lot of them are parking, over, well over 50%, 56% are parking in city facilities as well. Evenings and weekends, they fill up even more. But they, they do use some, these are their residents, but they, they fill the streets and the free lot. This is, now this is something that has changed a lot over the last 15 years is uh, a lot of students work, they have other things going on, they use their car very often. So they not only bring, they're not just bringing their car uh, to, to school, dumping it and picking it up before Thanksgiving, but they're using it every day. They do need access to it. Uh, to have it a mile away or, or something like that, it, it can be, is, is problematic to them. So. This is just a little breakdown of demographics of where they live. That's a pretty good mix, I think, across of what type of uh, places they live, the off-campus students live. The bus, the shuttle, which we, we heard was hard to recognize and hard to use, it has low ridership numbers. What low ridership of a bus tells me is that the parking's easy. Because if the parking was really difficult or really expensive, they'd be on the bus. Um, so. Actually, it might be nice if these numbers got a little lower and, uh, and the bus got a little more use. So that's the information we've gathered so far. Um, what we've got to do is finalize some of those I listed before. We're going to finalize the inventory and the occupancy data and finish off our other analysis. And now our second workshop that we have, um, we'll, we'll want to present findings and recommendations. And then we'll talk about some things that we suggest for the district. Um, but tonight, I, I, I want to ask a couple questions and get people's responses uh, so that I understand um, where the community is coming from on this. And um, first question I want to ask is just enforcement. So one at a time, just what do you think about the enforcement levels on the Hill, parking enforcement? I own a business on College Hill. It's been, it's been uh, almost annoyingly uniform. The problems that arose, I don't know if they were tied to the, you know, our, our winter was very severe. Yes. We definitely had some problems, you know, October, November, December, maybe in there and some of And I've heard something about personal issues, with, you know, because we basically had one person. Um, before that, I mean, to me, it was, it was, it was you know, rock solid. Okay. So the problems I'm aware of. By annoyingly uniform, you mean the exact same route, exact same thing every day? Yeah. Okay. My business is low energy, so I'm primarily, you know, that lot that is on 27. Okay. Anybody else on enforcement? I'll just remark that again. It may be appropriate, but it's also sort of cruel when you have that snow. It's the only time they ticket them for being there over 48 hours because the snow shows they haven't moved. And that's when the students really can't move their cars in some time. So, I mean, it may be good, but it may be cruel. Understood. Yes? Is there somebody else? Things that they need to become more aware of is the fact that the kids have done pretty smart on this business of getting the ticket. 
I have kids who carry tickets with them all the time to slip onto their windshield wiper. Uh, and the only way to stop that is if the, uh, if the police are willing to get out of their vehicle and read all those tickets because some of those tickets are some of those tickets are a month, two months old. Okay. It's a good. It's a good old trick. I sell mine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do have uh, real estate uh, rentals around the campus, and I I do see tickets out uh, for some of mine are the other every other day, Tuesday, <coughs> opposite parking on Wednesday, and that type of thing. So yeah. I do see enforcement. That's why I sell my tickets. I think that's a great market for Anyone else? Yes? It's a big money generator in the city. Okay. Anybody else? I think one of the frustrating things for people that have, got, have received so many tickets is that we see a lot of enforcement, but not a lot of support from the city side as far as maintaining those lots. <clears throat> so, uh, perception is we get the last round of snow removal, um, the last round of, you can check out the lots there and some disrepair, but the last round sure. of repair, but yet we have the best enforcement. Okay, got it. Any, anything else? I know there's no way to control this, but um, one of the things that happens to us is when they park in our private parking, by the time we call a tow truck, uh, you know, you might wait. It, it's too late. I mean, yeah, they, get, they take off. They, they know that I came by and they're, they're going to be gone. They're, Especially if it's 12, 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. There I sat waiting for a tow truck, and most of my tow companies don't, don't want to come at that time in the morning. So the kids know that if they park in my parking, that they can sit there all night because I'm not going to come in there and call my tow truck. The way the system's set up, I have to be there, and I have to tell the tow company that it's okay to tow that car out of my tenant's parking. Sure. They have, my parking's all the sun. they have liability, yep. Yes. I think there's some inconsistency as far as the uh, enforcement when it comes to there's signs that say no back in parking in certain lots. There's a sign that says no more than two hours per day. Uh, I've worked up here for a number of, number of years and I had received a ticket one day because I was there for 20 minutes and then I came back later that day and I got a ticket when I was there about an hour and 40 minutes and for some and of all the years I've been up here, I've never noticed that the sign got pointed out to me. And then there's some times where you'll see tow trucks uh, in that that one lot that's usually uh, completely empty or under 60% that they'll park and take up six spots and they'll be there all day. And I don't know what they're doing or where they're at. Okay. Um, but you see that happen quite a bit. So there's inconsistencies as far as who is enforced and how it's enforced and when it's enforced. So I think that becomes a little bit of a return for some people when they get a ticket for retired being on the line and then they get a ticket and then the next time they might not be so anyone else i can make just one remark that um maybe not recently but in past years i've seen them ticketing before Eight in the morning. Now I don't know whether there was some other violation. So this on the alternate side, and they were get, and there was someone who was putting something on the windshield before you know, eight in the morning. Okay. Uh, Anybody else? All right. I, I we talked about it a little bit, but I did want to clarify the transit center garage. Who, who does, I kind of already let the cat out of the bag, but who thinks there's confusion about what that's for and, and who can use it? And does anybody have any comments about that? Like I said, there's empty spaces in there that are available for the public. 
Would you use that? Would you pay to park in there if you knew, hey, I could just go there and not have to deal with any other hassle? It's in the public place, sir. It's just far enough away. Okay. Um, you could probably get lucky with something closer. You know, that, you know, we're, there's two distinct parking uh, periods in the winter and then the rest of the year. Um, I think even in the winter, you'd probably be better off. You can probably find something on, on the 22nd. Just a little too far. On the hill. Yeah. I mean, I walk my dog almost every day, and I knew there were some metered spots, but I didn't know there was as many spots. <coughs> yeah. So I think the signage is an issue. It is. And they, they do send people, I mean, if you're a visitor to the university, that's one place they tell you, go park there and pay the meter and, and, and visit the university. I think it would, it's convenient for some, right? So what David sure. was it's inconvenient for people using the hill. But as you show, there's two streets. <coughs> I live in those dorms right there. And I parked on that street for you know, full time. <laughs> and that was to save money. But if those streets would be Over here, Murner and Campus. Campus and Murner that if you would have a metered situation there and it wasn't free, it would be a heck of a lot more convenient for people to pay to park in the ramp than park right. on those two streets. And then also, the kids, the other free lot that you show is mostly full. If you go there now, the school's out, it's not going to be full. Right? Not going to be full. So if those kids had to pay to park in that lot, it would be once again more convenient to park. So it is inconvenient for the, for the district, um, but it's not inconvenient. You, you hit on a very important thing that I've, so the university sits here and they generate all this demand. They are the engine for, for everything, all this activity. And they have a parking market, because if you park on the university at all, you pay one way or another. You buy a permit or you pay to park in, at a meter or something like that. The city is providing free parking all over, all over here. So you have a market, a regulated market here, and free parking with some rules over here. Who do you think is going to get taken advantage of most? It's going to be the free parking that's going to get taken advantage of the most. And that's one of the issues that I see up there is, is, is working a little more with the university. Because they, they've established that paid parking works and we can get money for it and, 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 and people will be part of it. I have, a, I have another, I thought it was interesting, you showed, if you go back to your initial slide about how full it is on the Documency hill. slides? Sure. You didn't show, so just this year, the university bought the bookstore and right. they installed the meter. Did you ever right, have yep. There? And that became a meter lot. Yep. And so it's all full, right in red. I agree with that. But this, the school did, uh, you know, create an example. What would happen if the meter and there's a, there I, I can't believe, you didn't study that to see. Oh, well, I counted it. There's all, plenty of spaces in that lot all day long. Yeah, and so it's just, I think that is proof of a concept, because for years that was full too. Before, yeah, before we, it, this was the first year. Oh, that's, that's just this year. Yeah, they just bought it. And it that's the first year it was metered. And up until now, you were showing this map last year, and full. Okay. Hey Brent, if my if my kids there across the street park over there, one of the still the bookstores, then my kids would they would, they would catch the dickens and most of them would get them moved right away. <coughs> my kids park over there. Yeah. Well, it used to be the same rules as the one that's completely red. It was the same rules as the one that's completely red. But didn't uh, you book chain it up at a certain point? Because it's always been you know private. And then it's not only municipal, of course. Right. So, and obviously, the spot that you and I took is private. Right. But I think they used to put like, a catalog on that for some time. No, no, we never did. We tried to monitor it as best we could during normal business hours. And yeah, we did take it because we could see some of the people consistently being there. And it was probably your, your channel. <laughs> and then we would jump on them. But, you know, we, we let it be a free for all. Five o'clock on the morning. It was a great, you know, at night when I would come up there and close the school. But for the most part, it was empty out during the day. But there were times it was full a lot during the day, which created problems for our customers at times. Um, 
multi model parking ramp is expensive. It doesn't allow overnight parking. It's you have a climb up and climb down the stairs and the little elevator. But it's it, it's not that user friendly. It's hard to pay. I think last time I was there I had to have cash. It wasn't taking credit or debit cards. So you can double check that. But it's it's not you know, if you're going to a conference at UNI, it's great. If you're going to University of Open Supply, not so great. Sure. I mean, it's close, but you, you still have a vertical transit there. Most people are taking the stairs. You can have another block. I uh, that other thing, just in general, the comment on this study, when I look at the borders, it worries me that I'm not seeing that there's uh, an examination of what happens as you increase parking pressures by metering spots and whatnot. People do move out to those free spots, which moves people out right. to residential and stuff. Well, it, the whole concept of if you make this more difficult, say you were to meter it or somehow regulate it so that people couldn't park there, would they push out here? Um, you know, there's a, there's a human behavior element that comes into play is, okay, at what point do I stop, do I not push any further and I just buy a B permit so I can park down here and, 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 and have a spot because uh, this is too far away. I mean, people are here because it's close, it's easy, and it's free. And, and w even if I have a permit, but I can park right here and I want to be there, why would I park over here or over here? Even if I have a permit. You're just looking at the people that are looking to park in that central spot. But when you look at the people a block away that normally park a block away, two blocks away, because they live there, they now are moving. Right. It's them that are moving. Right. Yes. Okay, um, there are two issues here. One is parking during the day, the other is parking at night. You said that off-campus students can buy university permits. That's for commuting students. I don't know, what does the R permit entitle you to? I'd have to put, the R permit allows, I believe, 24-hour parking uh, in the R lots, and they are... Oh, by the... Um, they're both way, well over here. Right. I mean, maybe if the university would consider selling 24-hour um, permits in the parking garage or in the parking lot by the lab school to off-campus students, some of those students who live in the neighborhood might actually buy them so they wouldn't have, because it'd be more of a reasonable price than the day price at the parking garage, and it might you know, loosen up the areas a little. And, and, and it's worth talking to the university about what they're willing to do to work with the city on those things. So we did talk with them, um, and, and it's worth continuing to talk and see how those things can be, be done. What, you know, there is, there is a fair amount of parking in the area um, and, and how it's used and how it's managed. That's what we're focused on in the is how is it managed and, and, and how do you use it effectively. Yes. Oh, real quick, we are live. And I have the only mic for the live. So if you ask a question, I, I'll repeat it so that they at least know my, what my response is to the question. I was just going to say, one reason that the parking garage might not be full is just because of it's pretty easy to actually park closer. It is, yeah. This lot, this B lot that's right next to the garage, which is a student lot, that thing's hopping. Oh, over 100% full. All, almost all day long, up until 3, 3.34. So um, students want to be on this side of campus. And so, and that's, that's a nice lot for them. Is there an example of um, the question that was raised, maybe from a different city, that you could study to see what happens when you do meter close? Do, do they, in fact, move out farther? Or do they, what you said, they start to buy packs. I mean, because it's, it's a good question to be raised is would this just make the, the problem somewhere else? The truly price sensitive will move. 
that sliver of people who said, I'll walk three or four blocks uh, for free parking will move. Uh, but the, that question about how far are you willing to walk, two to three blocks, that really is a, a key indicator of what you've got. If suddenly I've got to walk four blocks to get to this building and, and I can buy a B permit and I don't have to worry about getting a ticket and other stuff, I'm just going to do that. At some point you just say I'm going to do it. The B permit I believe is $90 a year, give or take. I think that's right. I um, apologize for not knowing that off the top of my head. But the, the permits at, at UNI are not, I mean, yes, it's another expense on top of everything else you're spending, but it, they're not completely outrageous. To your example, the two or three blocks, being willing to walk takes you completely outside of, again, your area of study. So you're not looking at that impact. Right. And two or three blocks takes in a lot so I, I didn't do counts, but I did drive over here, and, and things definitely, right now, that's not happening. With the scenario is if we did something different in here, would it push out there? There would be some. I, I, I can't tell you exactly how much that would be. Um, but the, yeah, again, it goes back to human, human nature. Once you push someone three or four blocks away from their destination, they'll make radically different decisions. Inside four, they'll live with it. Outside four, then they start to look for something different. Um, and then there's just cost level variations. What am I willing to pay so my life's not miserable anymore? You had a question back there? I just kind of, this might be a, a really hard question. And maybe, I don't know how much time you have. Was there any kind of correlation as far as, part of the university, as, far as class times or days? with some of the parking and where it might have been? Because I have I, I notes up there, I mean, you can, if you're late to class or you have a 45 minute <laughs> class, you can go in and be out before, you know, somebody would ever come check your car. Sure. And at the same time, it kind of correlates to the next person coming in 45 minutes for that, you know, it's four cars and, you know, three and a half hours between 9.30 and sure. 1 o'clock. I didn't know if that had any kind of correlation with the classes that are around those buildings that are the most conveniently parked right there. This lot is a two hour parking lot. Um, we're on Thursday night, but if you go to the daytime, it's a two hour parking lot and people, I, I saw them pull in, run to class, one class, or they've got one thing to do on campus, they, they do something over in here and they head back and they're gone. They're not breaking any rules. It's a two hour lot. They're just, they're just living within the guidelines that are there. So yeah, that happens. What's the closest distance to the the next university parking lot besides that ramp uh, in that area? Hmm, I don't have that ramp up. The closest. If it's not, if it's not the ramp right there. Is it clear across? Is it clear across the, campus? Over here and down here. Most of the university's parking is over here. You have seat parking by the former lab school. Up here. Yeah. This lot. C, C P and C. Yes. Yeah. There's some. Yeah. So there's some up here. Um, there's a fair amount over here, and then there's some down here. So I'll, I'll put out the question out there then. Um, if you could just change one thing about the parking on the hill, what, what one thing would you think would make the biggest difference? Or what's the biggest pain point? What's the, the biggest issue? Best spot to park is the right one. <laughs> For my customers. That's the best spot. I mean, that's where everybody wants to be because it's free and it's closest to the majority of It's closest business. to all this. So, yeah. if there was one thing that I would say is to change the rules for that lot. I, I've never understood why we're metering the lot back off of behind. Which, this yeah, one. Why we're metering that one, but not the best one. It just, I don't get it. Well, the red one's near. The red one is not. No, yeah, it's near. Just, well, she's going to buy a market. Yeah, but you know, it's free. Right, but I mean, you can't, right. It's time limited. You know, it's free, but time limited. This one, you have to pay to be in at all. So, yes, I understand what you're saying. Younger and did not even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> My businesses have young clients 
myself and I run a bar and I don't and we're in our seventh year and I've never talked to a customer about poetry. And I'm not making that up. It's just not They're figuring it out. It's just not you know, the retail business next door once in a while, they're not very well. And they're again they're extremely young, they're excited about stuff. They, it's parking is it's over here, it's not here. Sure. I understand if you're looking at an older demographic, it's a bigger issue. Anyone else? One thing? Well, my previous comment be interested to see if the university could provide $90 a year overnight parking. Some of the people who live in the converted houses you know, might take that option if there were lots near their houses. And that would make the overnight situation a little nicer. Yes. Sorry, well, I thought, do you have an idea of how many actual parking spaces that UNI actually has? How many UNI has? How many on um, UNI campus? How many do they? How many parking spots do they have? I think he sent me that information, but I don't. Seven hundred thousand students, and I'm assuming that's not including faculty and staff. Right. I don't know off the top of my so, head. Uh, I, I'm, okay. I'd be, curious, I'd be curious to figure that out if if they're. 50% park for the occupancy between students, faculty, and staff? Are they 100%? They have capacity. They have empty spots. Mm -hmm. um, what I see at most universities around the country is because of schedules and, and everything else, most universities have between, so, say there's 10,000 students, they'll have four to 5,000 parking spaces. 40 to 50% of the student population, they'll have that in parking spaces for the whole for everybody, faculty, staff, students. Um, but no, talking to the parking manager at UNI, they have capacity. If for some reason something changed and some of these students uh, were no longer allowed to park here, the university could absorb them. But I don't have an exact number on that. Anyone else? I just mentioned that that capacity will include the dome lots, which are even further away than yeah. some of the other lots. The, if I had a map of the university, uh, of the whole university, you'd see the same thing. The lots right around it are full, and the ones way out here have room. It, 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 just human nature. Do the, and the buses go there? The bus, they do. Um, but uh, my guess is it's faster to walk. <coughs> so, yes? Uh, the phone's going to make one change. Just put more meters and make it easier to pay with your phone. I didn't catch what he said. He said if he would make one change, he'd say put, put up more meters, but make it easy to pay with your phone. When you're talking about meters, are you talking about meters just in the city lots, or are you talking about meters on the street parking as well? I guess I was thinking mostly about the lots. Yeah. And, then just, and, and I'm not recommending paid parking. Don't let's not start that. But paid parking is a tool to manage demand. That's what that's what costs are. You know, because some people say, "Oh, I'll park a little farther away and walk," or They'll do different things. That's how you manage behavior. So your, your thought process of, hey, I'll, I'm willing to pay if I know I have a spot. Just make it easy for me. And, and I'll, I'll, put up, I'll set up the app on my phone and I'll pay before I even get out of my car. Actually, though, the number one thing I can do is make sure everybody knows that there's actually a place for More communication. More communication. You know, when you looked at the survey results, the survey results didn't match the existing situation at all. Many people thought it was almost impossible to park, or very difficult, when it actually wasn't. You got this, this one lot's green a lot of the time. I, I do think signage, wayfinding, communication is always key. And, and putting, you know, you want it to be intuitive to some, I mean, to some extent, you have to kind of be familiar. This lot's not easy to find if you're not, not familiar with the area. It's behind buildings, it's off this side street. This yeah. lot's you know, you can pull in there, but this is a, that's a busy intersection. You know, this lot's accessed from here, 
So you know, there's things like that that maybe make it a little easier to find a little, a little better signage and, and more of an interactive map. But the mobile payment, you know, if you have to pay, the mobile payment's awesome. And, and we're seeing that grow by leaps and bounds across the country, you know. I think the lot that you're seeing that's empty is also in horrible, horrible shape. I know I avoid parking here because I don't feel like breaking and I'll just walk into my destination. And it's on a, I mean, it's on a steep slope to begin with. So when you have four or five months of icy winter weather, no, that's not going to be my number one spot to pull into. And it's just, it's, I, don't, I don't know why it's not getting maintained. I wouldn't say that's, I would have a number one, number two thing. I would love to see that lot resurfaced and redone. And I'd love to see more public parking. For the concentration of people, it just seems like more public metered parking as a lot somewhere close in would make sense. I can't tell red from green in the front line, but the picture. <laughs> the green one is a little bit long. Okay, we yeah. have the building just across the street from that. Here? We, we park as many cars some nights in that parking lot as are in, in our private parking as are in the uh, parking lot behind the OD. Yeah, you'll see. We don't, uh, uh, we don't get calls on that. Up and down the street, there is a, the, you got a lot of these apartments, so there's, there's a fair amount of parking buried within those blocks for the residents. But, but we have one parking stall per bedroom on all of our properties. Yes. John, if you're looking for an idea, the first two or three blocks next to campus, I'd consider uh, resident-only parking. Here? Yes. And then if you go well, south of University Avenue, 28th and 29th Street, I own property there. And I regularly see you and I staff parking there in the morning, walk to go to class and teach, and then they come back <laughs> at four or five in the afternoon and leave. And they're using the street parking there. Yeah, okay. And then, like I said, the interesting thing is that's it's all within the rules, and they're not breaking any rules. Anybody have any questions about what we're doing, where we're trying to get? Staff, did you have anything else to add? John, you just touch on any timing, next Yeah, so as we finish up this part, we've got we've got now got some work to do on analysis and, and really developing those right, uh, recommendations. So sometime in the next six weeks, or give or take, uh, we're going to come back and we're going to do another one of these with recommendations. And then we can talk about some of those things and throw up some ideas and, 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 and see how that's going to go and, and talk about how to manage this area in a way that's conducive to people using it, people getting to businesses, people parking at their residence, and uh, least amount of hassle for everybody, but access for as many people as possible. Anything else? Thank you for your time. Much appreciated.